build relationships with people. At the end of the day, it really is all about people. That is a lesson that I wish I had learned a lot earlier in business. And I learned over time, real estate is a people business, but now it's not a real estate thing. Business is people. And that's something I learned from a mentor of mine. Business is people. So put your effort into the people thing. And if it makes sense, the opportunities for the money will come. But the people part's got to be there first. So I think. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, also known as the Private Money Authority. And on this podcast, this is where we talk about how to raise private money without even ever asking for money. Well, I'm so excited today. I have got a very, very special guest. Uh, he's actually a former student of mine on uh, how to raise private money. He's got my private money courses and et cetera. And so now to date, he has raised many millions of dollars in private money. And we're going to dive deep and talk with him about how he has gone about doing it. So when you listen to this entire episode, you'll be able to duplicate and implement how my guest has gone about raising private money. He's a real estate entrepreneur. He's been doing business in real estate in multiple states, and he's done all kinds of deals. He's done hundreds and hundreds of deals that span across all kinds of strategies, such as wholesale deals, fix and flip deals, rentals, and he's even done new construction. Well, in just a second, we're going to dive deep and talk about how he has raised millions of dollars in private money. So in just a moment, you're going to meet my very special guest, Mr. Frank Iglesias, right after this. Well, hello there, Frank, and welcome to the show. How are you, Jay? Thanks for uh, having me. I love the uh, the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm excited to have you on and to interview you about how you've gone about raising private money, the uh, strategies that you have used, the strategies that you still use today, because after all, this is the Raising Private Money show. And so that's what we're going to talk about. But before we get into that, take us back, Frank, to the beginning of your journey, how you got involved in real estate. Um, and by the way, it's just so good to see you. I don't think I've actually uh, been able to hang out with you since you were at one of my private money live events. But take us back to the beginning of your journey. Yeah, the beginning of the journey. That was when I, like so many people, were going back 2008 and I got the email don't remember who sent it to me or how I ended up on a list, but it was about going to a rich dad, poor dad event and went to check it out. Two hour seminar, whatever it was. And of course, walked out of there like so many of us did like, whoa, what's this about? And that led, I'm sorry, that led to the three day event, which then led to us buying courses and Roughly five or six months after that first um, two hours ish seminar, we bought our first property and it was a buy, fix and rent. And this is early 2009. And during that time period, as we now know, the real estate market was crashing. We didn't know. We we're like, hey, houses are cheap. That's pretty cool. Without really having an understanding of what was going on. And we really didn't for probably the first couple of years. We were just so excited to buy a house and put a renter in. And then we would do that. And we did that a few times. And that led to wholesaling, which then, then we got into some flipping more or less around the same time, fix and flip smaller projects back then, right? There was a lot of uh, easy projects back then because of what was going on with the foreclosure crisis. 
But as time evolved, we got into larger rehabs and eventually that led into the new construction. And so we've had the opportunity to play in all these spaces. Uh, we even got involved with the Airbnb thing, short-term rentals. Of course, when we started it, it wasn't called any of that. It was called vacation homes. This was back in 2012. Uh, so we'd never even heard of Airbnb. In fact, VRBO was still kind of new and it was called, I don't know if it was the same or different company, but it was called HomeAway back then. Mm -hmm. So we even got involved in that space real early. And so it's kind of funny when you hear these terms today, like Burr, the whole buy, rehab, whatever the acronym is. I'm like, well, we were, that's how we started. It just didn't have a marketing term back then. So that's kind of like the short version of how the the last 15 years have gone. Sure. It's been my experience, Frank, in visiting with many, many real estate investors, um, having well over 600 episodes here on Raising Private Money. There's a trend that I hear real estate investors sharing that have raised private money. And the com one of the commonalities that I hear all of them say is, something happened in their business, in their real estate investing journey. There was a trigger. There was a pivotal moment to where something happened to where the real estate entrepreneur decided, you know what? I need to fund my deals a different way. And they started seeking and learning about private money. For instance, in my case, my first six years that I was investing in real estate from 2003 to 2009, I relied on the local banks, institutional money. And that's when I learned that my line of credit had been closed uh, with no notice to me. And so that's when I had to find a better way and quicker way to fund my deals without relying on institutional money or banks, uh, et cetera. And that's what caused me to start seeking and learning about private money. Tell us your story. What happened in your business? Because my guess is you didn't start out your real estate investing business by using private money. What is it that came along that triggered you that pivotal moment to start learning about private money and raising private money? Oh, so yeah, trip down memory lane there. So when we started hard money was how we started. Use hard money to buy refinance now refinancing of course we're talking 2009 10 11 it was not that easy and as another thing we learned the hard way it was not easy to do back then because capital was tight in the conventional markets for rentals but what we learned was hard money at the time typically was five points 15 percent interest that was normal that's what we came into so we didn't think anything of it. We're like, okay, that's just what it is. So when we were introduced to this idea of private money, we'd probably you know, invested for probably a couple, two, three years at that point. And it was sort of a, well, hey, you don't need to pay five points and 15%. You could do 12% interest and no points, and that's normal. And we just thought, well, Okay, that sounds good because the five points, of course, when you do a hard money deal, typically you pay that up front and no one's ever going to complain about a lower interest rate. And oh, well, and then, you know, it was the, the typical story back then was, you know, avoid the stock market. You know, you could get an uh, asset that's secured by real estate. And, and I don't know if it was like a major aha moment as much as a, hey, there's this alternative to hard money that's cheaper, easier, faster, and you could move quicker as an investor. And so we were like, well, that sounds pretty good. So we tried it and we're like, hey, it worked. So that was pretty cool. So, so for us, it was really about just a less costly alternative to hard money that we didn't even know existed, didn't even know it was a thing. Sure. Well, you know, a, a lot of people toss around these terms, hard money, private money, and sometimes those terms actually end up being interchangeable the way people talk about it. But as you know, and as I know, there's a very, very big difference between hard money and private money. So let's make sure that everyone that's tuning in here to this episode really understands what we talk about 
when we're talking about private money and hard money. So take a moment and explain what's the difference between a private money lender and a hard money lender and the, the different ways that, you know, those loans are structured. You know, I, I have to giggle a little bit because I've got a, a good friend who is a commercial lender and it's mostly hard money, but they really, a lot the, today, these commercial lenders that are hard money, they don't want to be called hard money. <laughs> so, oh, there's a big movement. They're wanting to get away from the hard <laughs> money term and they want to call their hard money brokerage firm private money. Yes, and of course, yes. I understand why. And by the way, I don't knock hard money lenders. Some of my best friends in the world are hard money lenders themselves. In fact, they've used my techniques on using, on raising private money in order to raise money for their funds uh, yeah. to loan back out to real estate investors. But anyway, go ahead. What's the difference between hard money and private money? So th there's a lot of similarities, but with the main thing I have found is hard money these guys that are doing this, it's a business. Like, and some of them are conforming to lending law. Some of them are with the AAPL, even though that's private lending, but it's really hard. But whatever, again, kind of to your point, they start kind of convoluting the words together. But what I find is the hard money people, they're really running as a business. They're doing it day in, day out. Like you said, they're raising capital. Maybe it's their own. A lot of times they raise it. Sometimes it's funds. Sometimes it's hundreds of people. There's all sorts of arrangements they have set up, institutional capital. Whereas your private money lenders, nine times out of 10, maybe 99 out of 100, these are people like it's your friend down the street. It's your colleague at work. It's someone that you've got a relationship with that has some weight to it. It has some time to it. There's credibility. There's trust. It's, you know, it's a much more personalized experience, whereas the hard money is a very business-like experience. And, and it's, it's really two different dynamics of conversation. Even if, even if the terms are exactly the same, the dynamic of the conversation and what has to happen is, is two very different experiences. I mean, that's, that's what I see the differences today. Exactly. Well, you know, the hard money lender most of the time is a broker of money. They've gone out, they've raised actual true private money for individuals to invest in their fund. And then they'll turn around and broker that money out, charge a higher interest rate than what they're paying to their individual investors or private lenders. And uh, then of course, as you mentioned, they're going to charge points. They're going to charge extension fees. Another really, really big difference is, you know, as the borrower, when you're investing in a uh, property, how much money is the lender going to advance to you when you buy? Well, those are very, very different. Your hard money lender or broker is typically going to advance you maybe 65% or 80%, depending on your relationship with the hard money lender, maybe 90% of purchase. But in this world of private money, where we as the real estate entrepreneurs are actually raising our own capital, uh, we're getting hundred percent of our purchase. If there's a renovation or rehab involved, then we're getting hundred percent of that up front as well. You know, there's a great check and balance, uh, when you're using private money. And that is if you can't bring home a big check, uh, when you buy without taking any of your own money to the closing table, you shouldn't do the deal. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, if you can't bring home a big check, then obviously you didn't buy it at enough of a discount in order to do that. And Frank, I think you'll agree. One of my, one of my biggest uh, reasons that I love uh, private money to fund my deals is that we, as the borrower, we get to make the rules. We set the term, we set the interest rate, we set the length of the note. You know, the traditional way to borrow money uh, for real estate is you go to the local bank or any kind of institutional lender and get on your hands and knees and you beg and you apply and you have to provide verification of income. They're going to pull your credit score. Well, in this world, none of that applies. You know what's interesting, Frank? Of the 47 private lenders that we have right now uh, loaning us money on our real estate deals, not one of them had ever heard of private money until what did I do? I put on my teacher hat, my private money teacher hat. 
And I started teaching people in my own network what private money is, how they can get high rates of return safely and securely, and taught them what self-directed IRAs are and how they can use existing retirement funds to invest passively in real estate. So that's why none of my private lenders ever heard of it is because they haven't been exposed to it. And you know, one thing that you alluded to just a moment ago, Frank, is that all these private lenders, they're everyday people. These are not sophisticated, accredited investors. Um, I would, I'm pretty sure I'm like 100% sure not any of my private lenders are accredited investors. They're normal everyday folks, but you know, what's interesting. I mean, one of uh, my private lenders, uh, is a husband and wife. They're retired from teaching in the school system, um, for 30 years. And they've got over a million dollars in retirement funds that they're investing, uh, with me and, and my deals. So it's every day, you know, walk of the mill, you know, just regular folks, just like you and me, uh, Frank, you've, you've raised millions in private money. What do your private lenders, uh, look like, uh, or, or is your private lenders sort of like what I'm describing everyday people? Yeah, typically by and large, the majority of your everyday person, they're not involved in real estate, or maybe they have a curiosity toward real estate but they don't have the time to really dive right in, but they see the potential benefits and gains from it. So they will, uh, you know, they're, they're willing to roll the dice with it. So no, I, I agree with you. It's very much, it's your everyday person. Okay. They're not, they usually have other ambitions. They're doing things with their families and so forth. So yeah, I mean, it's, they, and, and there are people that want to keep it easy. Okay. They're not looking for complexity. Uh, you know, sometimes I'll see someone who wants to be a private money lender, but they're super savvy at finance and that sort of thing. That's more, yeah, those can be a private money lender as well. But th those folks are really more like just true investors. And they understand that real estate is just another vehicle where they are going to put money versus your typical private money lender. They're not a true investor per se. You know, they're the doctor, they're the pastor, they're the you know, the, the, the chiropractor, the, you know, whatever, you know, maybe they're a small business owner for, you know, a mom and pop shop, you know, that kind of thing. When you started raising private money, Frank, in what ways did that affect your business? I mean, what kind of breakthroughs did you actually experience when you started using private money for your deals? I think the biggest breakthrough in the, you know, back in the early days, I think what we just saw was, uh, to your point, there was more flexibility. There was more flexibility. And now when you say more flexibility, exactly what do you mean by more flexibility? Well, you, of course, the initial terms, right? There's less, you know, ropes to jump through. But then once you're in the deal, it's, it's like you said, you're in control of the deal and they're trusting you to execute it. Now, in a, in a way that's fantastic because you have control and you can really let things roll the way you need to. But on the flip side of that, there's much greater responsibility to that. So you have to be really careful because yeah, you get the control. Yeah, you get the perks. But if you get it wrong, you also get the headache. So you've got to be actually, I would actually argue that when you get private money, you actually have to be even more diligent than when you get hard money. Because with hard money, if they don't like something, they'll just shut it down and say, no, nope, we're not going to do it. Go renegotiate or whatever. With private money, you don't tend to get that. And so one of the lessons I learned over time was we really need to be even more diligent, more so than what I might have learned back in whatever class I was in back then. Because back then I would be like, hey, let's go to the fix and flip seminar. And I feel like you know, we really got to talk when you're borrowing private money. Yes, it increases a lot of flexibility, gives you a lot of freedom to do things, but there is a higher degree of responsibility. And that comes with a, a potential burden if you if you fumble the ball. So you really want to, you know, you got to dot your I's, cross your T's. It's very important. By the way, if you're listening to this episode and you are a real estate investor and you really want to raise a lot of private money very, very quickly. I'm so excited to announce that I just have released 
my brand new seven day private money challenge. So this is seven days of a video series. I just finished recording them. I poured my heart and soul into these trainings and they're only 15 to 20 minutes long on each one of the video trainings. So if you'd like to get private money really, really fast, come join me in the challenge and you can enroll at www.privatemoneychallenge.com. That's privatemoneychallenge.com. You'll learn how to raise a lot of private money very, very quickly, and we'll have a lot of fun doing it. So Frank, let me ask you another question about private money. What are your favorite ways? Like when you started raising private money or even now, I mean, you've raised millions of dollars. What are your favorite ways to raise private money? Favorite way, uh, networking, just, just talk, tell people what you do, listen to what people are looking for just in general conversation in life. Uh, sometimes people will tell you what they're doing and that can open a door. Uh, sometimes it's a friend of a friend, you know, it's a colleague of, you know, that you have that knows somebody. It, it really is the networking uh, with people and not just about business, but just, just being a human being really just talk with people, see what they're about, see what's going on. And you know, it's, it's amazing. You never know where it's kind of like deals. You never know where that next opportunity is going to come from. And I have found with raising capital, it really is the same kind of thing. It's you just, you just talk and Next thing you know, someone's saying, well, you know, I know somebody that has, you know, X, Y, and Z or such and such is interested in, in, in doing some business or investing because, you know, they're hanging out. They need something to do. They need somewhere to put their money. Uh, so running away networking has been what we have found to be the most effective. Yes, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, it's been my experience that private money is right underneath your nose all the time. Um, and, you know, sometimes people will ask me, and say, well, Jay, where do you find these private lenders? Well, here, here's the answer to that question initially. Write down who do you see on a consistent basis every week? Where do you go? Like consistently, where do you go every week? And you see the same people consistently. For example, my wife, Carol Joy, and I, we go to church three times a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Well, I'm seeing the same people by and large all those times, three times a week. Well, it would be no surprise for you to learn that we've got a lot of private lenders from church because we see them consistently and whoever you're seeing consistently. I mean, do you go to the gym? Well, if you go to the gym the same time every day or every Monday, Wednesday and Friday, odds are you're seeing the same people there at the gym. So that trust bridge is already built because of the familiarity of you seeing these same people. Um, so I want to, I want to ask you, Frank, about lessons learned. What would you do differently if you were, what advice would you give to a new real estate investor that's just looking to raise capital now? What mistakes maybe did you make or you've seen other people make and what advice would you give them on how to start out? and and not make certain mistakes. I know one of the first mistakes that comes to my mind that I've observed, but I'll let you go first. Ooh, we could talk a long time on this one. <laughs> first one I would say is you really need to dissect with people tolerance for risk. Because a lot of people will tell you, oh, let's do it. Let's lend money. Let's invest. And it's sound. It's always great at the beginning. It's always a honeymoon, right? Especially if you've got a good deal. But assessing risk is twofold. First, there's your part with the deal itself. Are you out, are you being conservative on this deal? And have you taken into account the worst case scenario to make sure, you know, if the worst case happens, you're still good? Okay, that's very important. And that's on you as the investor. The other part of it is how tolerant is that private money lender to risk? There are people that I have come across when you talk about lessons learned that lent money that now looking back, I'm like, they have no business 
lending money, they need to go put it in a CD, stick it in an index fund in the market and be content because they don't have a risk tolerance for when something goes wrong. The reality is in real estate, when we do deals, rarely does it ever go according to plan. We've done hundreds of deals. It has rarely ever gone according to plan. And different people have different tolerances to risk. And so if you have, get a private money lender who doesn't have a good tolerance for it, all of a sudden you kind of become an unpaid shrink for lack of a better term. And that's not a fun place to be because you're not getting paid, you're spending time and really you're consoling them, giving them assurance. And that is mentally exhausting. It's exhausting for them. It's exhausting for you. And even if the outcome is still fine, it's a lot more effort. So I think assessing risk tolerance of the private money lender and really being conservative in your numbers, truly conservative, don't paint the deal to be better than you think it is. And I'm, I'm convinced this is a great deal. Get, you know, I tell people that I've coached, get a, get a third party opinion, get a coach, help me with that deal. Well, let them assess the deal and see if they agree with your assessment on if you're being conservative with that deal. If you're conservative, that in, reduces the, uh, the uh, possibility that their concern of risk will come in. But even if it does, because again, things can happen, right? We saw what COVID as an example everyone can relate to. That turned a lot of worlds upside down. When the unexpected happens, you do want to make sure that private money lender is someone that can handle, you know, some semblance of risk. Because if they don't, if they're if they're very risk averse, that may not be a good fit. Thank you for sharing that, Frank. Well, Frank, before we wrap up, um, any other final advice that you would like to give out to our audience on raising private money? Do's and don'ts. Oh, do's and don'ts. Well, the first do is network with people. Uh, when people ask me, where do I start looking? I always say, start with your cell phone. You know, Jay, you were saying, who are the people you hang out with exactly? And sometimes you could just go down your cell phone and you might rekindle some relationships with people you want to hang out with, whether you do business with them or not. It's amazing, you know, the things that can happen when you just take some time and look at your contact list. Uh, because there's, there's, like you said, the money is everywhere but it's about the relationship. So that kind of leads to the next do, which is build relationships with people. At the end of the day, it really is all about people. That is a lesson that I wish I had learned a lot earlier in business. And I learned over time, real estate is a people business, but now it's not a real estate thing. Business is people. And that's something I learned from a mentor of mine. Business is people. So put your effort into the people thing and if it makes sense, the opportunities for the money will come. But the people part's got to be there first. So I think that's the biggest do. As far as a don't, I think the biggest don't I would share is kind of, again, kind of picking back up where I was at a moment ago. Don't convince yourself you've got a great deal. It is 100% worth getting that coach's opinion, third-party opinion, it is way easier to have someone tell you your deal's not as good as you think it is and have to renegotiate it or maybe even walk away, maybe even lose earnest money if that's part of the deal, than it is to go forth with a deal with private money and it not work out because that's not a fun place to be. So, you know, really being conservative at the front. Yeah, I can't overemphasize that enough. I think that's incredibly important. Frank, thank you so much for sharing your experience. And how can people that are listening here to the show uh, reach out to you and continue the conversation? No, absolutely. Uh, I tell people you can go to my website, frankiglesias.com, and you can fill out the little form there, contact me, or you can call me, 678-408-2228. We're old school. Call us. And if I don't pick up or a team doesn't pick up, leave a voicemail. We really do call people back. Uh, the reality is most people don't leave voicemail. So I always tell people, leave a voicemail. Or you could find me on all the social medias. I mean, if you just Google Frank Iglesias Real Estate, uh, you know, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and so forth, I'll come up. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not too hard to find. And I'm happy to uh, talk with people and chat and 
see what kind of opportunities are out there, or we can just chat for a few minutes and connect. Frank's website is www.frankiglesias.com. That's F-R-A-N-K, Frank, I-G-L-E-S-I-A-S.com. And of course, all those connections and links will be in the show notes. Thank you again, Frank, for coming along and God bless you. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate you having me. Have a good one. You got it. There you have it, my friend. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. And I need your help. If you happen to be listening on uh, your favorite podcast platform, iTunes, Spotify, all the others, we're on all of them. Uh, be sure and follow me so you don't miss out on upcoming uh, episodes that we've got coming along. And also, if you happen to be watching on YouTube, be sure and ring that bell, subscribe, ring that bell so you don't miss out. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. And I hope to be seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.